Thank you, Nadia, and thank you to everyone, um, especially the organizers, for doing this and for the political scientists for including um, other, dis other disciplines and approaches amongst you. I have been invited to talk about the implications of Trump's Jerusalem um, announcement, which is impending. Hold on, we just solved this, didn't we? The first one. The first one. All right. OK. So um, I'm going to read. I have a tendency to go on and on, so bear with me. In early December 2017, President Trump announced that the US would move its embassy to Jerusalem. On the face of it, the announcement broke with five decades of US policy on Jerusalem that in accordance with the Land for Peace framework enshrined in Security Council Resolution 242, did not recognize the acquisition of territory by force and insif insisted that the sovereignty of Jerusalem should be settled through political negotiations. In accordance with this policy, the United States has refused to move its embassy from Tel Aviv and has condemned Israel's settlement enterprise as a contravention of international law and policy. Simultaneously, and in the aftermath of the 1967 war, the Lyndon B. Johnson administration inaugurated two consequential policies on the conflict. One, realizing Israel's potential as a key Cold War asset, the administration established that Israel will have a qualitative military edge over its neighbors individually and or collectively. For this reason, the US has opposed and prevented the imposition of sanctions to avoid diminishing Israel's military edge. Two, the administration's commitment to a politically negotiated solution has made subsequent US administrations averse to imposing international uh, frameworks or any kind of external opposition to settle the conflict in order to avoid mitigating Israel's negotiating hand in peace talks. Together, and in practice, the United States has provided Israel with unconditional military, financial, and diplomatic aid, allowing it to complete its expansion without suffering any serious legal, legal or political consequences. So, while the Trump announcement seemed to signal a rupture with long-standing US policy, I argue that, in fact, it is a continuity of that policy, and Trump's announcement made it finally coherent. There are many ways to examine this moment regarding US Mideast policy. As an interdisciplinary scholar, one approach I've used is a settler colonial framework to better understand Israel's steady expansion and removal of Palestinians. For the sake of thinking through policy among this particular audience, today I will use a legal framework to better understand the significance of international law on this question. I'll begin by examining the legal regimes regulating the question of Jerusalem or its status. Then I'll shift to thinking about the consequences of the US's aggressive intervention and conclude by thinking about ways forward. Oh, oh. There are three legal regimes that have uh, regulated the question and the status of Jerusalem. Uh, between 1947 and 66, it has been uh, General Assembly Resolution 181 proposing partition. From 1967 to 1992, UN Sec uh, Security Council Resolution 242, together with occupation law enshrined in the Fourth Geneva Conventions, the Hague Regulations, as well as customary law. And the third phase, which we're still pretty much um, in, which is from 1993 to the present, uh, which is the peace process uh, inaugurated by the Declaration of Principles, also known as Oslo I. So as to the first regime, this is Resolution 181, which proposed partition the UN Special Committee on Palestine, proposed partition of an Arab and a Jewish state, and mandated that Jerusalem, because of its significance to uh, the three monotheistic religions, the home of 30, at least 30 religious sites, would not be under any particular national sovereignty, but instead enjoy international status as corpus separatum. 
When Israel established it itself by force in 1948, it captured 85% of Jerusalem. The other 11% came under Jordanian authority and 4% remained in no man's land. Israel established its capital there and rejected 181's um, stipulation that Jerusalem would be under no, um, under no sovereignty, arguing that because the UN did not use force to implement 181 and instead left Israel to do it for itself, that that particular provision was null and void. Simultaneously, of course, Israel derives legal uh, legitimacy for its establishment from that very same resolution. Here's another um, image of, corp of what that regime looked like. Is there a way to make this less sensitive? OK, here we go. In the aftermath of the 1967 war, Israel captured the rest of Jerusalem. In July 1967, and in the midst of UN deliberations on Israel's occupation of Arab territories, it annexed East Jerusalem under the veneer of administrative necessity and expanded its municipal boundary by 10 times, or 70 uh, square kilometers. So you can see that that expansion here and these expanded uh, boundaries. The General Assembly condemned the annexation and passed two resolutions. Uh, resolution 2253 and resolution 2254 within ten, 10 days of one another demanding that Israel rescind its annexation. The United Kingdom voted for both of these resolutions. The United States abstained on both of the resolutions. Um, and in, in November 1967, the Security Council unanimously passed resolution 242 which prohibited the annexation of territory by force and stipulated that the status of the territories will be resolved by political negotiations. The international community agreed that Israel was the occupying power in the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, and affirmed the applicability of occupation law, including Article, 4, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits civilian settlement in occupied territory. Territories. Israel has evaded this particular framework and the, and, and the imposition imposed by occupation law in two ways. It is argued that because the resolution 242 did not include the definite article the or all the um, in describing which territories were to be um, withdrawn from. So you can see here in where it says, here where it says withdrawal of Israel armed forces from ter territories occupied in the recent conflict, arguing that because it didn't say specifically which territories were to be withdrawn from, that it left it to political negotiation to settle this matter. So that it could withdraw, for example, from the Sinai Peninsula, from the Golan Heights, and not withdraw at all from the Gaza Strip or the West Bank, and be arguably in compliance. This is clearly a wonderful legal argument, depending on how you look at it. Um, Together with the argument about the scope of its defensible borders, here articulated by Igal Alon, who was the deputy prime minister at the time, Israel has maintained the legitimacy and legality of its presence in the West Bank. It, to get this was not enough. Israel has also made an argument that there existed no sovereign in the West Bank and Gaza, therefore leaving the territories in a sovereign void. And as a result of the sovereign void, the territories can only be disputed and not occupied. As a result of this status, occupation law could be applied as a matter of fact, but not as a matter of law, leaving it to Israel's discretion to cherry pick which provisions it could apply in order to regulate its administration in the occupied territories, but not necessarily mandating that it, it actually adhere to them strictly. So this legalized Israel's presence in the West Bank and Gaza without placing upon it any constraints to maintain the territorial, demographic, or political status quo preceding uh, June 4th, 1967. In 1980, Israel unilaterally annexed East Jerusalem, declaring it as its united capital, and the Security Council passed resolutions 476 and 478, condemning the annexation, declaring it as null and void. 
As many of you know on this question, even if you haven't studied the law, many of these resolutions have, despite their binding status, have not been controlling in the outcome. And this goes back, of course, to the US's role in aggressive intervention to both um, maintain Israel's qualitative military edge and to maintain Israel's negotiating, negotiating hand without the imposition of external um, elements like inter what international law has to say about it. Fast forward now to 1993. The Oslo framework established yet a new legal regime that did not necessarily obviate applicable law as established since 1967, but made the law more contingent and tenuous. The Declaration of Principles established a two-phased approach and replicated almost verbatim the 1978 Middle East Peace Framework established by Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. The interim stage would last for five years and set the stage for final talks where the most difficult issues, including final borders, settlements, refugees, and Jerusalem, of course, would be discussed. Significantly, in Oslo 1, there is not only no reference to international law, there's no reference to 2253, 2254, 476, 478, the Fourth Geneva Conventions. There's barely reference even to what should have been controlling, which is security resolutions 242 and 338. They are only mentioned in the preambular text with a commitment that any political solution would therefore satisfy these legal obligations, uh, thereby enshrining what the US wanted to achieve, which was maintaining that the balance of power would settle the outcome rather than have international law shape it. The Oslo framework, committed as it was to an unfettered political resolution, cast the law as an impediment to negotiations rather than a foundation for it. And under its framework, 54% of Israel's settlements in Jerusalem at the time were considered Jewish neighborhoods. And so now when, when Netanyahu and uh, even US administration officials talk about natural population growth, that these are not settlements or against international law, it is totally and completely in compliance with this particular legal regime, which Palestinian officialdom has been complicit in um, and acquiesced to in their hopes that the US would deliver a sovereign state. Together with the fact that the interim stage has proved interminable and the fact that talks have been bilateral and mediated by the United States, which has been blatantly partisan, the outcome has been a steady process whereby Israel has established facts on the ground in the attempt to cement its sovereign claims. This has included the route of the separation barrier, you can see that the purple shaded areas are the expanded municipal boundaries since 1967. The blue areas are, is the route of the wall, which the International Court of Justice deemed illegal in 2004, which the US Congress condemned and Israel rejected. Um, but other, other plans to uh, expand and make as a, uh, a fact on the ground has been um, Israel's E1 plan. I guess that's, you can't see that here has been Israel's E1 plan as well as the Ring Road. So, in its commitment of maintaining its dual policy of Israel's qualitative military edge and an, um, a political solution, this has led to a steady increase in the number of settlers in the West Bank. This does not include the approximate 200,000 settlers in East Jerusalem. All right. So, Whereas we might think that the Trump administration has therefore signaled a rupture when it announces the moving of or the establishment of a new, it's going to establish a new um, embassy in Jerusalem next week. That's what we're um, hearing. In fact, that's completely in line with everything that previous administrations have done and made possible. Even the Obama administration, which is responsible and lauded for its abstention on UN Security Council Resolution 2334, condemning uh, the settlement and enterprise, the Obama administration itself did that too little too late. In February 2011, it vetoed a similar resolution on settlements. And um, just months before two, three, uh, Resolution 2334, it increased its military aid to Israel from $3 billion uh, a year in a 10-year MOU to $3.8 billion a year over 10 years, amounting to $38 billion. So Trump's announcement, and for my concluding remarks, does it, will it work? Okay. Um, 
Uh, under this framework, what Trump's announcement actually does is removes the emperor's clothes on US policy and officiates it, uh, what, it what it's been doing for 50 years, which has been supporting and facilitating Israel's expansion and control. The General Assembly condemned the US's announcement uh, Trump's announcement by a, vo a vote of 128 to 9. The U.S. blocked a similar resolution in the Security Council. The U.S. is set to establish a new embassy, as I mentioned, um, next week, perhaps, as soon as next week. What does this mean? The two-state solution has long been dead, but kept at least, and I will argue if you want to ask me, it's been dead since 2000 definitively, um, but has been kept up on stilts for a lack of vision together with diplomatic intransigence. This announcement should make that final, although as we've seen in the discourse, uh, two states still remains alive as Israel is presenting um, a deal of the century and is threatening to uh, reduce all of, withdraw all of its aid from UNRWA to force the Palestinian official dump back to negotiations. Um, the official leadership is still committed to US, a US mediated solution despite this damning empirical evidence. And although Mahmoud Abbas has rejected the deal of the century, what we understand is that the rest of officialdom around him supports it and wants the Palestinians to accept whatever they can get at this point because it's literally the end of what might be even derivative sovereignty. In contrast, Palestinian civil society has shifted to emphasize their claims using a rights-based approach. This, uh, we've seen this both in the articulation of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, but we've also seen it in the past few weeks since March 30th in the mass organization of the Great Return March in Gaza, as well as um, within Israel and beyond, and has actually increased support for Palestinian rights. We've seen in recent victories, um, as in Durham, North Carolina, where they recent, the city council recently um, ended its collaboration with Israeli security officials and no longer, will no longer send its police forces to be trained in Israel. As a result, we also saw Natalie Portman, a dual citizen of Israel, who has refused to travel because, to Israel to accept the Genesis Prize um, as a result of these policies as well. The diplomatic track is heading towards a dead end. At its most successful, the uh, Palestinians would receive derivative, derivative sovereignty in autonomous regions and provide a green flag for Israeli policies aimed at cementing its uncontested sovereignty that features unregulated use of force, the securitization of Palestinian civilians, civil administrative and military laws that directly harm those civilians under the framework of national prerogative. Still and nonetheless, no outcome is yet inevitable and so much remains dependent on, especially upon Palestinian initiative. Um, and I want to draw from earlier from what Professor Anderson was telling us about the future of states or the, the future of their uh, uh, of their, their, their irrelevance, which that Israel, what Israel is doing in, in really reinforcing its garrison state is one model for the world and what the possibilities of Palestinian futures offer, may offer are other more productive models. Thank you.